So uh, CBDC, stable coins in the future of money. I'd like to thank Sands and my employer, Movement Company, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Steve Barra. My introduction to Sands, as uh, Stephen mentioned, was through Stephen Wolber's SEC 555 course. So it's great to be back here. Previous to my employment at Wolfman Company, I worked at a crypto mining firm startup, seeing it grow from just a garage to acquiring over 10 industrial properties across New York and becoming, at the time, the largest mining firm within the state. I transitioned to the financial sector in 2020, working now primarily with banks and fintechs, focusing on regulatory and compliance. So that's why I'm excited to be discussing this with you all today, as this is a new emerging area within my field. Some terminology before we start, CBDC stands for Centrally Backed Digital Currency. Stable coins are digital currencies designed to be pegged to a reference currency, i.e. the USD. So we will be opening up the presentation with the executive order on ensuring responsible development of digital assets and the President's Working Group Report on Stable Coins. These two reports lay the groundwork and justification for the creation of CBDCs, the upcoming regulation, and the benefits of the government hopes to achieve through such technologies. After, we will discuss the history of money, how we'll be reverting back to old ways, and how the EO and working group goals and its objectives will be met with the future of money. So I think the timing of this presentation, the EO is very opportune. Stated within the EO, and I quote, within 180 days, within 180 days of the date of this order, provide the president through the APNSA and APNP an assessment of whether legislative changes would be necessary to issue the United States to CBDC should it be deemed appropriate in the national interest. So as you can see, uh, the date of this report was March 9th, 2022, which this means in about two week times, the report will be furnished and presented to the desk of the president. I expect by early 2023, a public report will re be released to banking and financial institutions and how to gear up for implementation with a full rollout sometime between 2024 and 2025. And this is something here at Wolf we've been working on for the past six months or so, trying to align our own services to support our financial clients for the upcoming changes. Anyways, the goal of the EO and what they hope to solve through such technology and regulation can be summed up into six main points. These points are consumer protection, financial st stability, illicit uses, promotion of responsible innovation, financial inclusion, and U.S. leadership. Consumer protection is one of the main goals of the EO, in part will go to understanding the technology as well as the volatile micro and macroeconomics of the crypto industry. A better understanding on the government's end will help them understand where the current popular financial system is failing some consumers. My opinion on this is that the government will plan on helping their agencies aid businesses in crypto adoption as an effort to lessen, lessen the massive volatility in crypto so many people have witnessed. Funding has been allocated to expand DOJ and FBI investigative units to ensure consumer protection is at the forefront of the EO, as well as broad enforcement of established laws. Financial stability plays into the consumer protection part of the executive order. The president wants the overall financial sector to be less volatile, quoting the pre-COVID Bitcoin price of $10,300, November 2021 price of $70,000, and at the time of the EO, $38,000. Using this as a benchmark, he wants government agencies to educate more people, including themselves, on why this volatility happens and how to prevent this kind of instability through encouraged adoption. The goal of the Fed has always been monetary policy. In recent history, we have seen the Federal Reserve exhaust their playbooks to stabilize the economy. A CBDC will give the Fed new ways to enact their policy, something we'll touch later on in this policy, in this presentation. It alludes to uses. Like I mentioned, the EO also states that the DOJ and FBI have their own crypto investigation units that need more funding, as well as broader enforcement of existing laws and regulations. And I quote, the insufficiency of the international implementation of anti-money laundering networks and frameworks with digital assets is the greatest vulnerability of these ecosystems that criminals are currently exploiting. The digital dollar could very well have money, anti-money laundering checks built into the code. Privacy concerns aside, traditional methods of evasion will be greatly reduced, if not entirely eliminated. This is something that we're going to touch back on later in the presentation as well. Promoting responsible innovation, a senior advisor has stated that crypto is creating thousands of jobs in a brand new industry. Innovation is and has been a pivotal role in the American economy, and the government does not want to be left behind when it comes to innovation. Financial inclusion, I would say this is the chief goal of the EO, as well as the only thing which has not been fully defined. However, this aspect is related to the future of money publication by the Treasury, 
the President's Working Group report on stable coins, as well as the future plans to evaluate the necessity of a digital dollar issued by the central banks. So undoubtedly increased financial inclusion is something we'll circle back to as well later in the presentation. U.S. leadership, this is more of an all-encompassing part of the EO that's basically saying the U.S. needs all government agencies to provide leadership as well as guidance. We will fall behind on innovation, something we have led in the world since the Reconstruction era. A senior advisor was quoted saying, remain committed to working with allies in the broader digital asset community to shape the future of digital assets systems in a manner that's inclusive, consistent with our democratic values, and safeguard the integrity of the global financial system. I performed some due diligence on who exactly quoted this, but, exa but even in the official documents, it has been redacted. Uh, I guess there's, they've been taking some tips from Satoshi himself. Next, uh, the President's Working Group on Stablecoins. The SEC has already greenlit institutions with banking charters to roll up stablecoins. Currently, there are several firms that have been working on building out the infrastructure to support the integration between their core systems and the blockchain. Um, and I expect in five years' time, you very well could see your local community bank release its own stablecoin. In summary, the purpose of the, the President's Working Group on Stablecoins is to identify the regulatory gaps related to stablecoins with the potential to be used as a means of payment, present recommendations for those addressing gaps. Moving on to the history of money, I think everyone knows the ba basics, bartering, gold, coinage, paper money, and so on. Uh, but I want to focus on paper currency and rewind 160 years ago to the 1860s uh, during the golden age of private currencies. Also known as the free banking era, the founding fathers made it clear that the power to create money would not be taken lightly. They had many experiences with inflation, uh, one being the Revolutionary War, war that made them worry of paper money and became conscious of the power wielded by those authorized to create it. Private money, which is money issued by individuals or companies, can be seen as an innovation during this time that arose to fill a void left by the federally provided money of the day. Currently, stablecoins exist to reach stability in a volatile market. In the future, stablecoins and blockchain technology will share the same status as other global financial networks, such as SWIFT, ACH, and FedWire. Looking back to the free banking area, private currencies did have some drawbacks, which included wildcat banking. During this area, bank closures and outright scams regularly occurred, leaving people with worthless money. Counterfeits, counterfeits became rampant. Uh, by the 1860s, an estimated one-third of all currency in circulation was counterfeit. With over 1,500 state chartered banks, it was a paradise for counterfeits. Uh, they often traded less they often traded at less than face value as the currency tra traveled further from the issuer. And they were backed by high response. Um, the Civil War caused a cluster of Midwestern free banks to fail only to the depreciation of Western Southern bonds they were obliged to hold as backing for their notes. However, there were many benefits such as they were more reliable. I believe we have witnessed dramatic devaluations of central bank currencies, private commercial banks, uh, which are banks issuing a currency against claims to a reserve asset, have historically been more reliable. Enforcements of these claims at the time was a matter of commercial law than one of public policy. So the chief weakness of central banks as currency issues, issuers in this day and age is that their inability to bind themselves to the redemption promises. Their public monopoly status has given them immunity from all legal and marketplace sanctions. Additionally, there were incentives for quality control. Shareholders were incentivized to avoid devaluation of defaults, thus limiting the bank's liabilities. And finally, there were uh, uh, finally transfer of seniorage, which means who's actually profiting from the currency issue. The bulk of potential seniorage is kept at home. Competition among the banks distribute, distributes it to the currency holders in the form of unpriced banking services. So this can be seen as waiving fees, uh, higher savings rates, and so on, banks can use this seniorage to reinvest in unmatched banking services. Finally, uh, as with other nationalized products, quality is often lower than it would be under private competition. We can reference the National Post Office, railroads, and so on. Future money. So as I stated previously, stablecoins exist currently to reach a stability in a volatile market. In the future, stablecoins and blockchain technology will share the same status as other global financial networks, such as SWIFT, ACH, and Fedwire. But additionally, the rollout of regulated bank-run stablecoins allow banks, both large and small, to get the benefits listed above 
of the private currencies without any of the downsides. Wildcat banking would be remediated through banks required to keep audible reserves. Counterfeits would be impossible, leveraging blockchain technology. And the issue of private currency trading at less than face value occurred, like I mentioned at the time, due to the fact money tra traveled further from the issuer. Electronic payment systems make this a non-issue. For consumers, the benefits of stable coins include lower costs, safe, real-time, and more competitive payment methods. However, there are some disadvantages that have arose in this space. As crypto assets are used as a medium of exchange, their network may grow large enough to become a systematically important payment system which means that that is a payment system whose failure could threaten the financial stability, like in the case of Tether USD. The collapse of Tether threatens the entire crypto market, making up roughly 55% of the circling supply of USD pegged public stable coins and about $40 billion in daily volume. The collapse of Tether would have cascading effects in the crypto market and greater markets, financial markets as a whole. The Terra Luna crash alone resulted in a panic in the market coinciding with the total market capitalization loss of roughly 60% and directly $200 billion of evaporating for the course of a couple of weeks. This is something perhaps the market is still recovering to this day. And at the time, Terra only made up, Terra USD only made up about four to 6% of the total circling supply of stable coins. Tether's reserves have been an ongoing issue, which is why regulation audible reserves are crucial. Congress has introduced legislation that require more transparency from stable point issuers, signaling that they've tactfully accepted the presence of private currency in the US financial system and are choosing to, are choosing to regulate it rather than ban it. I think some interesting speculation in the future would be a currency being backed again by commodities, precious metals, oils, and real estate to name a few. Whether that is a state, or uh, you know, private bank at a state or private banking level, it is some speculation into the future. A commodity-based stablecoin, rather it'd be you know called a pegged coin, would leverage smart contract and oracle technology, producing a token that is worth a fixed amount. Again, this is just speculation. There's nothing at the regulatory just yet, um, which you know I'm expecting to you know be that more vetted out as stablecoins and the regulatory environment becomes more clear. Future money. Uh, CBDCs are not a new idea. Early efforts at digital cash include DigiCash in 1989 and Eagle in 1996, and both were issued by central agencies. Uh, they were great at financial inclusion and reduced payment friction. As outlined earlier in the presentation, the goal of a CBDC is to be the vehicle for monetary and social policy that could restrict their, their use to basic necessities, specific locations, or defined periods of time. Example goal of CBDCs encompasses our economic security programs. Uh, these programs prior to 2020 accounted for about 11% or $665 billion of the federal budget each year. Improper welfare payments, including welfare fraud and welfare abuse are estimated to be about 15.2% of all federal welfare payments. Alone, they totaled $161 billion in the fiscal year 2021. A CBDC, leveraging smart contract technologies, would help remediate many of the issues these programs face, whether that's restrict restricting the service they're spent on, location. Uh, another social policy would be the long-term strategy of the economic world formed to achieve net zero greenhouse emissions by 2050. At WEF 2022, Michael Evans stated, we're developing through technology and ability for consumers to measure their own carbon footprint. That's where they're traveling, how they're traveling, what they're eating, what they're consuming, and this technology could be very well integrated into the US CBDC and something that administration has been passionate on. So possibly in the near future, carbon credits uh, would be allocated and owned by individuals as an initiative to reduce the greenhouse emissions by real and ver verifiable amount through CBDC technology. Individuals can cause GHG emissions from a variety of direct and indirect activities including transportation use, electrical use, home, heating, and cooling. Something that you might have noticed uh, on some of the largest booking platforms are now showcasing carbon emissions. Uh, these very well may become hot, commonplace at grocery stores uh, over certain sourced food products uh, when you fill up the pump and so on. On the monetary policy side, traditionally, if the Federal Reserve wanted to st stimulate consumption and investment, it could cut interest rates and make cheap credit available. However, that only goes so far. 
With the creating US economy, we saw the Fed cut short-term interest rates to near zero. This monetary move did little to establish, to stabilize the situation. CBDCs offer untapped monetary potential. For example, the Fed could impose negative interest rates by gradually, gradually shrinking electronic balances in everyone's di digital asset account, driving incentive for consumers to spend and companies to invest. A burn function, something we've seen commonplace in many cryptocurrencies, could be very well implemented as a mon monetary initiative. Furthermore, off-the-book economic activity would also be hindered, as anonymous cash transactions would be out of the shadows into the formal academy. In summary, the future of money will go beyond facilitating payments. It will deeply affect every faucet of our lives. I think broader awareness in the technology, the potential use cases and resulting implications is needed. New technologies could and have historically led to segments of the population to be left out on the outskirts, outskirts, whether they were unable or unwilling to learn to happen. With the digital age moving faster than any one person could keep up, certain policies against all our best interests could get passed during the fall of war.